Scripture tells us that the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ. And he's the one in whom this morning that we worship. He's the one in whom this morning that we serve. He's the one in whom this morning that we bow our hearts down to. Because there's none greater than the Lord God Almighty. There's none worthy of our praise, of our glory, of our honor, but our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ the righteous. Amen? Amen. Amen. Just shout with me this morning. Just lift your hands to heaven and say, Glory to God in the highest. Glory to God in the highest. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. That wonderful name that wonderful name where every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess to the glory of the Father that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. 
You may be seated as we are going to get ready to prepare for communion. This one, as you can see, the uh, pastors are not here this morning. They had uh, to leave urgently last week. For Pastor Judy's mother's passing. And I just want us all to remember the Angles family and the Turkington family as they go through this time of grief. And if you do desire to, to have a card of condolences, we'll have a, uh, something placed in the back so you can always put a card there just to remember the family, that letting, letting them know that you love them and you're remembering them during this time of grief as uh, Mother Angle has gone on to glory land at 94 years of age. Praise the name of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's one thing to live long, but it's another thing to live long and to carry the torch of the Lord, so to speak, leaving a legacy. And the, that, that legacy is one of Christ. The legacy of the Lord Jesus Christ that you pass down to your children. And she have done well in doing that for her children. That pass on the, the, the legacy of Jesus Christ that they too can pick up that banner and pass it on to their children. So let us remember uh, pastors in, in prayer and the family of, of the angle for during this time of loss. So at this time as we prepare, I just want to read the scripture as we prepare for communion. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, I'm going to read a couple of verse, verse 23 through 24. And the, the word of God says for I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, you don't have to take it right now, just read in the scriptures if you bear with me a little bit. Uh, in the same manner, he took the cup after supper and saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's debt until he comes. This, I believe, is a believer's communion because we are remembering of our great Savior, of what he has done for us, procuring eternal life for us. Our sins are forgiven. But not only that, the scripture tells us here in verse 26, for as often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, you preach and proclaim the Lord's death till until he comes. So we also have in view and this great anticipation of the coming of our great Savior. <laughs> Hallelujah. Can someone... That communion. If you don't mind, you can grab your. Thank you. You can grab your communion element. And remembering of his body. His body was pierced, lashed, wounded. The scripture tells it that Christ has borne in his body our sicknesses and disease, and he carried our sorrows and our pain. And as we partake of these elements this morning, let us reach out to him in faith, believing that if we have any pain, ailments, sorrows in our bodies, we we'll look unto him who has borne our sorrows, our pain, our sickness and disease, so that we can receive healing and strength in our physical body. And in like manner, when we take the cup, is to remembering that his blood was shed for our redemption, restoring us into like right relationship, not just religious and just attending church, but in a right relationship with the true and living God, transforming us from within. It's not from the outward, but he changed us from within. And so as we partake, let us partake by faith. And let us bless the Lord. Father, we just thank you as we partake of the body and the blood of Christ. We thank you, Father, for all that you have procured for us through Christ Jesus. And we partake of these elements, Lord. Let it be so unto us, Lord, that we'll truly come into experiencing of our union with Christ in every measure that these elements has procured for us. In Jesus' name, take of the bread. 
enough the blood thank you Lord Jesus that precious blood where we have received redemption our sins are forgiven and as we come before him, we thank God truly indeed that we can come before him knowing that I have been forgiven by my great Lord and Savior so let us with great thanksgiving and faith reach out to the Lord and take of the cup praise the name of Jesus thank you father just lift our hand and say father we just thank you this morning to God be the glory 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 father let it be so Lord as we have partaken by faith all that you have procured through the life, the death, and the suffering of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May it be that we experience this fullness of redemption in our physical body, our soul, and our spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, John. Well, at this time, you look to your neighbors, to your right and to your left. And I just want you to just reach out and... Just encourage one another and says you look beautiful today and thank you for being here this morning. Today I want to welcome our online family. Thank you for participating with us this morning in our worship service. We're so glad that you're part and parcel of who we are as the body of Christ and the fellowship of part of Celebration Church. I want to thank you again and we want to encourage you to continue looking forward in faith to see what God is going to speak to your heart this morning in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Well, at this time, we're going to prepare for our tithes and our offerings. And, you know, it's, the scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. Not only that, but it says whatsoever person so at that, whatsoever you sow it, that shall you also reap. God's word is true. And I know we all know that his word is true. Those of us who are here, those of us who are watching via the, the internet, and as we obey the word of God, blessed be his name. We can look back and see the hand of God, his provision in our lives. He says he will never forsake the righteous to see them lacking in any wise in the sense that God will never leave us alone to say that we are forsaken by him. He will not forsake us as we walk in obedience to his word. We obey him in everything that we do. We know that God, his blessings, his favor is upon our lives. So, Father, we just thank you for you have truly indeed gracious with your bountiful goodness and your blessings. And in faith, as we give of our substance, if we give of our first provision, we thank you for your blessing that you have sanctified it, you have redeemed it, O oh Lord God, and the continuity of your blessing into our hearts and into our lives. And I declare your blessing upon your people this morning as we give in faith in Jesus' name. As we say again, there's various ways to give. You have a, um, you have behind the, your chairs, there's a pocket there, and there's a envelope that you can put your offering, or you can go to Celebration Church celebrationchurchnc.com and also give there. Thank you very much. Hey everyone, welcome to Celebration. We're so glad you're here today. If you're new, we encourage you to fill out the Getting to Know You card found in the seat back pocket in front of you. Then take your card to the Welcome Center right after service. We'd love to meet you and answer any questions you may have. We also have a free gift waiting for you. Here are a few things coming up at Celebration for you and your family. Sorry, I'm getting ready for church. Parents, there's nothing quite like getting the family ready on a Sunday morning, making sure your kiddos brush their teeth, eat their breakfast, and look halfway presentable as they head out the door. We know how it is. Wouldn't it just be great to have one less step in the morning rush? Well, hold on to your PJs there because Daylight Savings is coming Sunday, March the 12th which happens to be pajama day over in Sea Kids. We wear our pajamas to church. You gotta lose an hour, so make it easy on yourself and send your kids over to our pajama party. Plus, we're gonna serve pancakes between services at 10, 15 a.m. 
It's also a great opportunity for your kids to invite their friends to church. What a better way to learn about Jesus than in your jammies. It's going to be a blast. We'll see you there Sunday, March the 12th. Spring forward, have fun with us at Pajama Day in Sea Kids. See you on the lawn. 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 We'll see you on the lawn Sunday, April 16th. Are you new to Celebration? If the answer is yes, we welcome you. We're so excited that you are here and we want to make you feel right at home. We know that coming to a new church can be a little scary and you may have some questions. Well, our hope is that we can help provide answers. Our pastoral team extends an invitation to you to join us for a time of coffee and conversation on Sunday, March 19th at 1245 p.m in meeting room three. This opportunity is for you to get to know us. Ask all the questions you'd like and enjoy sipping some coffee alongside our pastors. Sign up today at celebrationchurchnc.com. Cheers. Cheers. Okay, ladies, Friday, March 10th is our girls' night out. If you're looking to have fun, experience the power of God, make connections and grow in your faith with other women, this night is for you. Pastors Judy and Cherie are eager to share a word from the Lord that's going to have a lasting impact. Plus, we've got a special treat. Emily Sheeb is going to share on the power of color and how it enhances your natural beauty. You'll walk away with tips to feel confident as you get ready for the day. Child care and light refreshments are available. Head to our church app and register today. Don't miss this chance to renew your mind heart and spirit. We can't wait. If you're ready to partner with us and restore hope, come and join any of these amazing opportunities. May the Holy Spirit speak to you as you listen to today's message. Hello, Celebration. We are looking forward to being with you. I'm Pastor Ralph Holland, along with my wife, Donna, we are excited about what's going to happen on March the 19th. We want you there. We're going to talk about famous last words that revolutionized the world. So don't miss this great event, this great Sunday of your church on March the 19th in both services and those that are watching online. We invite you to tune in also, and we're going to have a great time talking about some famous last words. See you March the 19th. Well, good morning, Celebration Church. Thank you for being with us today as we get into the Word in just a moment. But obviously, before we do, I need to explain why I'm not here today. Uh, there's a saying that says, plans change, but vision remains the same. Uh, some of you, and maybe many of you, are aware that on uh, this past week, on Tuesday, Judy's mother passed away. Uh, she had been in hospice for few weeks, uh, 94 years of age, and we knew her time wasn't too far away. And so she went to be with the Lord on, on Tuesday, and uh, she is now with Jesus. So we had that service yesterday uh, up in Ohio, and my family and I uh, needed to scoot up there to be with uh, Judy's family, and of course to take the time it takes to, to celebrate. 
And so thank you for your prayers and for your love. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow and uh, back in town and here next week, of course, to teach again. And so I had to record this in advance uh, so that we could stay on schedule with what the Lord has us on. Uh, Myrna was a precious woman of God, a, a wonderful mother-in-law, without a doubt, even though I felt like maybe she got her first blow in as she left because she, I think she kind of said, look, here's a way that you'll always remember when I die. I'm going to die on your 42nd wedding anniversary. <laughs> She's, she's not spiteful at all, but she's the delight. So she's with the Lord and we rejoice. And thank you for your prayers, particularly for Judy. They certainly mean a lot. Well, we are starting a new series today. I'm really excited about it because it's going to take us on a bit of a journey over the next number of weeks as we move towards Easter. We are believing, we're praying, we're trusting God that this will be the biggest Easter that we've ever had by way of the harvest of souls and people coming into the kingdom of God. Amen. And how that's going to happen is you are going to help us get that done. You are the army that God has helped raise up to touch people's lives in your sphere, in your parts of the world. My life and my world may not touch your world and yours may not touch mine. So I'm not called to go into your world. You are called to go into your world. I'm called to go into mine. But as we go into our spheres with the love of Jesus, with a friendly smile and a courageous invitation, why don't you invite some two or three friends and family members to say, look, this Easter is going to be fantastic. Our pastor is going to preach an amazing illustrated message that is going to make so much sense to you and you're going to enjoy it and, and join us and, and let's have a good time. And you watch what God will do as we pray in advance and we will be April 3 through 5 will be a time of fasting. You'll hear about it. And, as, and then we'll have Good Friday worship and come into Sunday morning strong and God's going to get the glory. Amen, amen. I'm excited to see what God's going to do. Well, in preparation for that, uh, we're going to be taking the next few weeks to talk about the famous last words spoken to us in the scripture by Jesus himself. When we understand what Jesus has said, when we understand what he is saying, we get a better picture and comprehension of his intentions and his plans for us. So let me set up the scenario a little bit this morning by giving a quick review of what for all of us is somewhat obvious because we're going to be focusing in around the time just days before Jesus was crucified. Jesus had spent the last three and a half years literally turning the world upside down by pouring into the disciples, not only the 12, but the 70, the 120, they all started going different places. And he performed supernatural miracles and manifestations of the power of God. People were healed, uh, some who were paralyzed from birth, others who were blind, they began to see again. People who had died came back to life. He drove out demons, he walked on water, he took authority over the wind and the sea. And, and he, he, he began to manifest himself as to who he really was. That he wasn't just a good prophet or a good teacher, but he was the Messiah, the son of the living God, and would be their, soon to be their savior. He taught them with anointing and with authority, and they were moved in their hearts, and people's lives were changed. But yet his message was somewhat strange to them. It was unique. It was the first will be last and the last will be first. You lose your life to gain it. Jesus came with seemingly upside down doctrine. In fact, in the book, The Root of Righteousness by A.W. Tozer, he writes a great paragraph when he says, a real Christian is an odd number. He feels supreme love from one whom he has never seen. He talks familiarly every day with someone he cannot see expects to go to heaven on the virtues of another, empties himself in order to be full, admits he is wrong so he can be declared as right, goes down in order to get up, is strongest when he is weakest, richest when he is poorest, and happiest when he feels worst. He dies so he can live, forsakes in order to have, gives away so he can keep, sees the invisible, hears the inaudible, and knows that which passes knowledge. 
Now, I don't know about you, but that is very well written. And A.W. Tozer was such a great mind and had a great hand to write. And he, he's depicted this dichotomy we find ourselves in when we're struggling to make life work and we think we do a few good things for Jesus and everything's going to be roses. No, we find we do good things and we bump into problems seemingly, but God is with us in the midst of them. And for us to really progress, we have to humble ourselves. For us to gain, we need to be willing to give or to lose or to sow seed. But Jesus is preparing us to practically live these particular values out. You see, he, he, he spent three and a half years of emptying himself into other people. He was investing into people. And now it's Thursday, and Jesus is sharing his last meal with his disciples. Because on Friday, the following day, he will be crucified. And he's just hours away from his death. And it's like that action drama where, uh, in, a, in a movie where the guy comes to uh, his last time and he's going to say those last valuable things. You know, remember, it's just, it's just one thing. Remember, uh, I can't remember his name now. Lefty, righty, whatever that, what his name was. That's that one thing you've got to remember. Or the, I'll be back. Uh, these, these, these last words that he was about to say. And obviously the words of Jesus are more meaningful and more powerful than anyone else's last words. But Jesus' fundamental focus was not on the crowd, but rather to gather on giving his disciples the key thoughts and ideas that would prepare them for living apart from his physical presence. He was preparing his disciples for the necessity of living with unseen realities. And this is why faith is such an important factor in our dynamic and our relationship with God. As Tozer said, we, we believe in a God we cannot see. We listen to a voice that no one else can hear. And, and most people say, you are absolutely crazy. Well, we are connected by faith with an invisible God who has given us values to live by that begin to structure our lives together. He was preparing the disciples to go out into their world, into their sphere of life, their sphere of influence to have a kingdom impact. And for that matter, that same assignment is still on the power of the word of God. And for that matter, fivefold ministry to minister life to the church and to the people of God to raise us up for the very same reason, to send us out into our sphere to make a difference. You see, what most Christians consider uh, Christianity today is not really Christianity, particularly American Christians. Because there is an Americanization of the gospel that has happened where we find in even different regions of the world where some of the doctrines and some of the belief systems we have don't quite have the same effect and vibe in other places of the world. I find it interesting that most Christians today, what they consider to be important, I believe the American church has missed the mark a little bit. We have formed a distorted paradigm of the Christian life. The American Christian lives for Sundays, for experiences, and we create lists in which we live by and we check our boxes and derive a false sense of satisfaction and success from those things. We live for what God is going to be doing this coming Sunday or what he did last Sunday. And we, we respond to the altar calls. We come and pray over things that we've prayed over for many, many years without having ongoing victory. And while there's nothing wrong at all to respond to an altar call, we, we have to understand that our life is deeper than just what happens on a Sunday. If you've compartmentalized your life, you're more spiritual on a Sunday than any other day of the week. A lot of Americans are like that, a lot of American Christians. I don't think you are because you're in a, a, a well-versed church that enables you to be stronger every day of the week. You see, we, we have an idea that the call of Christianity is to be kind and pay your bills on time, be forgiving, have patience and tolerance, having self-control and honoring the leaders God's given you and submitting to authority, embracing humility, raising your children well, loving your sp spouse, and all of that is important and good. But it's also about making disciples right where you are. It's about the duplication of the life of Christ in you. And my challenging question to you this morning is, who are your disciples? Can you name them? 
Are there people in your life that you are pouring into then the life of God that God has given you? We are not just a one-way street. In a few weeks, we'll be leading a trip to Israel and some of you will be coming with us and eventually we will get to the Dead Sea. It is dead because it has a lot of input, but it has little to no output. Our lives become stagnant when we receive a lot, but don't give much. And the more you pour out, the more God will pour into you. In Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against which there is no law. And at heart, this is really the essence of this new series as we look at the last words of Jesus and what he was imparting into the lives of these disciples before he left. We want to listen to his final words. We want to listen with great reverence at the final words of Jesus as he talks to them about what is truly important in life. So let's turn to the book of John and to the 13th chapter. Let me read a bit of a lengthy passage, and you know the story, but we want to just look into this a little bit. Verse 1. Now before the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand and he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a the towel that he wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Jesus answered, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but after you will understand. Peter said, you shall, not ne you shall never wash my feet. Then Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, said, excuse me, uh, said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. And Jesus said, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. But is, but is completely clean. You are clean, but, you, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. And, and that was why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garment and resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right. For so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash other people's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Now, when we think about this passage, and I came from a religious background where it took this foot washing very literally, and maybe some of you as well, and some of you are saying to yourself, what kind of church did you come from? <laughs> um, is that certainly an act of contrition? It's an act of humility. And the, for, for many, it was a, had a bit of a traditional inference of literally washing each other's feet, which is not altogether a, a bad thing. But traditional thinking on this passage is that we are to descend lower ourselves to a place of lowly servanthood, humbling ourselves and serving others. Now some churches have often taken foot washing services where they take turns to wash each other's feet and that's all good and I've heard it taught that way and even particularly in those services but that is not the essence of this passage. You see, there is an issue that Jesus is trying to address with them as some of his final words before he leaves. Because in this moment where he humbled himself and took on a form of a servant and washed their feet, he was including them into an a intimate circle of his life. And the real issue that Jesus was addressing here was that of isolation. See, the fundamental lesson is this. The, of the disciples' ability to thrive and impact their sphere after Jesus leaves will be that they learn to both give support 
and to receive support from each other. One of the biggest challenges that we face in Christian life, and I think even in our culture, as certainly as a result of the last couple of years, is separation, is isolationism, is that we've been detached from one another. And here in this example, Jesus is throwing us the example to say, this is not how I want you to function and operate, all individual and separate, but to be willing to not only give to one another, but also to receive from one another. You see, in, in this passage, Jesus emphasizes two fundamental or foundational commitments that we must embrace in our Christian relationship to avoid being isolated. And these somewhat overlap with each other. But avoiding isolation requires that we serve each other. Secondly, is similar. Avoiding isolation requires that we let others serve our needs. I often say one of the biggest challenges that a giver has is developing the capacity to receive. If you are a giver by heart, gifting, or nature, you like to be the one that's given out the gifts. You're, like the, you're, like, you're glad to be the one that blesses and have this and have that. And then when people try to give back to you, you respectfully think you're being humble, but actually you get all religious. Say, oh, no, 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 no. Don't need to give to me. You don't need to give to me. You're telling them you have the capacity to give, but you don't have the capacity to receive. And therefore even isolates you from the one that you have blessed. Not that you're looking for credit or recognition, but even just the connection because you have given something joyfully out of your heart. Allow people to give joyfully back into you. That's why the scripture says, give and it shall be given. If you give, God's going to increase your capacity to keep on giving because others will pour back into your life. It's a, it's a scriptural principle. But see, avoiding isolation requires that we both serve others well and let others serve our needs also. In this verse, when Simon Peter came to him and said, Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. He said, look, if I don't wash your feet, I'm not going to, you can't have any part of me. And so Jesus was differentiating between our relationship with him and our fellowship with him. This is an important principle for all of us to understand. I was raised in a church paradigm where the idea of relationship and fellowship were essentially the same thing. And Jesus is saying, there is a, you can have a relationship with me, but it's important that you also have fellowship with me. Some people feel like, I, okay, I confess Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. I'm a new Christian. I'm brand new. But I don't want to go to church on Sunday. I don't want to get in a Bible study class. I don't have to be around people. Look, I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. Oh, you may have a relationship, but you're missing out on fellowship. And fellowship is where we grow. Fellowship is where we're ministered to. Fellowship is where we become different people in the things that we're still working through in our lives. It is through our relationship with him that we have salvation. Yet it is through our fellowship with him that we experience the present benefits of our salvation. In essence, relationship is established, it establishes salvation when he bathes us from our sins and our fellowship with him maintained by allowing others to hold us accountable to his standards by washing our feet. Now let me illustrate this. I, I love to teach this principle and this is um, a little show and tell that I have to try to help you here this morning. You see, these two things are in operation in our life all the time. Relationship and fellowship. And our relationship with God is, is, is that which we, we have established in the blood of Jesus. And this is why this is red. This, is the, this represents the blood of Jesus that when we ask him to forgive us of our sins, we come into a vibrant personal relationship with God. But not only do we have relationship, in operation is also fellowship. That, is, that means that we have friendship with God. That we're not just his son by blood. We are his friend because of connectivity and time spent and fellowship. But if there is sin that comes into our life, many people feel like when sin comes into our life that our 
relationship is, is broken and our fellowship is broken and we have to start all over again and reestablish relationship, then we work on reestablishing fellowship and then I feel better towards God. Well, fellowship will, uh, sin will actually break or interrupt our fellowship with God, but it does not interrupt our relationship with God. Let me demonstrate it to you this way. When sin comes into our life and we violate the law of God, and what happens is that our fellowship with God is related. Why? Because of sin. You see that little black stripe on there? That's the sin in our life. But our relationship with God is left intact. But it is through repentance. It is through confession. Confess your faults that you may be healed. Confess your sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us and, and to forgive us from all unrighteousness. Through confession and repentance, while our relationship is still sound, repentance helps to restore our fellowship with God. It brings us back into parallel where we never stop being a son or daughter of God. Now the problem is we get into this state and we keep on going further and further away from God when there's not repentance. And sometimes it's difficult for, for people to make that, their way back once they repent and they have to fight through a lot of different things. Here's, here's my encouragement to you. If there is sin in your life and it's separated you from fellowship with the Lord, deal with it quickly. Repent quickly and keep moving on in your connectivity with God. Does that help anybody today? Amen. Well, see, in this journey that Jesus is taking us on, this fellowship piece, we want to personalize a little bit more because some of the terminology we're using here and what Jesus was demonstrating is fellowship also requires accountability. You can have fellowship with somebody, but if you don't move past just the perimeters of your, your, your talking and your jesting and, and all that, if you don't go in deep with one another, you're not really going to have the fellowship that your heart is really looking for. And, and uh, in, in John 13, he says, If I then, your teacher, Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also have to wash others. Now, as we go through life, we have been bathed and we're clean. But as we go through that same life, our feet tend to get a little dirty along the way. And we need other Christians to come along at times and say, hey bro, you got dirty feet. You need to clean those feet up. Let me help you. Let me wash your feet. The scripture says in Galatians, he said that, if you, that to bear one another's heavy burdens. And if you see your brother who sinned a sin, Come alongside him. You know, a lot of churches, thank God it's not this one. Because we would, if we we're going to change the name of the church from celebration, I'd like to change it to No Stones Church. <laughs> I've heard about 12 Stones Church, 8 Stones Church. They've got symbolism for a different reason. But I'd like to have No Stones. We don't throw stones at people because they have problems in their life. We all got problems that we could be stoned for. But when you see a brother with a problem, you come alongside him and says, we're to carry our own heavy burdens, but we're to carry one another's light burdens. And, he's, and he wants us to come alongside and provide that love in Ephesians 4 and 15. Speaking the truth in love, we may grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. We must take the initiative to keep our brothers and sisters in an up-to-date fellowship with Jesus. We help each other grow in Christ. It is not something you're designed to do all by yourself. And sometimes we get so isolated that we don't allow anyone else in to come and help us. But Hebrews 3.12, take care brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it's called today, for none of you may be hardened to the deceitfulness of sin. I tell you what, you can stop believing something that's wrong and in, in, in opposition to the word of God. Left to yourself, you'll start to believe it's the truth. But when you're with a brother or a sister who will speak the word and break the deception that's trying to overcome your life, boy, what a blessing that is. Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. For he who is faithful, 
uh, who promised is faithful. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. Not neglecting meeting together as the habit of, so, of some is. But encouraging one another. And all the most as you see the day drawing near. If there's ever a time that we've needed to be together and connected with one another in fellowship and with some accountability involved where someone knows you and knows about you and knows what you struggle with. If you're isolated and trying to carry it all by yourself, you have set yourself up for, some dis for, for potential heartache and trouble. But don't live that way. We're called to be together. This is what Jesus was saying in these last words and in, in the demonstration of the washing of, of the feet of the disciples. You see, in the settling of America, uh, this is listed in, in a, a book called uh, Drop Your Guard by Chuck Swindoll. Uh, he was talking in this book about the Europeans, how they came to settle in North America and found it so vast and unexplored. And for most of them, they were self-reliant kind of people and, uh, you, and they would you'd see them with their rifle and their axe and they're going out forging new territory and in those early days the government gave away large sections of land to anyone who would establish a home and people flocked west from crowded cities and villages to have their own land and before they could farm the land they had to build a house and they had to live in it and those initial settlers built their homes right in the middle of their land that way they could See if anyone is coming from any direction as kind of a security thing. And, uh, but they, they, the customs quickly changed. Their isolation did strange things to them. Professional photographers went west and recorded the life on the frontier and returned with the pictures. They found weird men, wild-eyed women, and haunted-looking children. Well, that's called California, I think. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they're still a little bit like that. We love California. That's right. Amen. <laughs> now, before long, those families learned to move their ho homes into one corner. And so what they did was hey, they had these vast properties, and they realized that the isolation out in the middle of this vast land was not even helping them physically, let alone emotionally. And so what they would do is four landowners would move their lands towards the corner where they could be in proximity to one another and have fellowship. They found out in this big journey that they needed each other. And that worked well until the late 1800s and there became the transition into the 1900s because as the industrial revolution uh, the, the gregarian culture, we're going from grazing and agricultural living into the in industry and technology started to develop and modern age, things began to change. And even then in the wars, the very difficult wars that this great nation has participated in, took the men away and drove the women to the workplace and after the, the war, a lot of women stayed in the workplace. And this really changed the dynamics of households and how people lived and how they functioned and operated. Then the technological boom drove families apart. And even now, with telephones, cell phones, at the dinner table, it's hard to have a decent conversation with humans anymore. And maybe you should draw a line and say, look, we're going to take an offering at the dinner table, all electronic devices, and leave them there until later and you will never see your children eat their dinner so fast as doing that that's right but the but what began to happen is an increase of depression and anxiety and all sorts of psychological and emotional maladies started to develop in fact they say that isolation increases your chances of premature death by 26 percent in other words you are not designed to be alone but here's some misconceptions about isolationism. Isolation is nothing to do with introversion or extroversion. You can be an absolute extrovert and still be isolated. Isolation has nothing to do with how much time you spend in the presence of other people or how much time you spend alone. The difference in isolation, there's a difference in isolation and solitude. Isolation is a state of feeling alone without friends or help. However, solitude is a state of being alone 
which in fact is necessary if you're going to develop a personal relationship with God. And I just had weeks of that, of being separated from my family to write and to spend time with the Lord, and it was tremendous. I'm a bit more outgoing person. I love to connect with people, make friends, be conversational, have fun. But God cut that off. It, I just, it just stopped in my life and I enjoyed it as much as I do other things because I was able to spend time with God. Uh, you can be completely surrounded by lots of people and still be isolated. Number four, isolation is all about your receptivity to people speaking into your life. Your, reps, your recep, receptivity to accountability essentially. See, accountability is ultimately about repentance. The, the purpose of accountability is to bring your life to a place of accountability. Now, this is not about control or manipulation or anything like that. But you see, you left to yourself, you will not be drawn towards God. Left to human nature, we take a nosedive in a hurry. And as the Bible says, we go back to the beggarly elements that we came from. But repentance is to bring us to a point of turnaround, metamorphu, of metamorphosis, a change from what we were to something different. And that's why I'm calling this book, Change is Not Change Until Something Changes. You can talk about it all you want. You've even tried to change on your own and say, I'm not going to tell anyone else about my problem. I'm, I'm just going to fix it myself. How does it go for you? You're probably still struggling with it, aren't you? Why? Because you're not designed to solve your own problems. You need God, but also God wired it that we need each other as well. Um, now, the, it is also the ability to say something, to extend accountability, and to receive the voices of others in your life as well, in receiving accountability. In its essence, it's hu humility. It is humbling to, to have your feet washed by somebody else. And it is a humbling thing to wash someone else's feet. Humility has to be embraced in order for it to work. You see, you say, well, I need an accountability partner. Well, a lot of people, what they mean by an accountability partner is they want someone else to keep them accountable for their actions and behaviors or for sin control in their life. And I'm not called to be your accountability partner. What, how, how, let me tell you how it works. See, some people have a wrong idea about accountability. You've got a problem in your life and you expect them to go find out what's wrong with your life. That is not being accountable. Accountability is you have a problem in your life and you go to somebody and you tell them, I've got a problem and I need help. That's accountability. And you get mad at people who don't come and ask you how you're feeling because you're going through stuff and they should know better. Who do you think they are? Think they can read your mind? You think they're the Holy Ghost and, and the Father all wrapped up in one that they know everything about you? They don't know everything about you. You look good on the outside. You must be doing all right. But until you open your mouth, no one will know how you feel. All right. But when they do open their mouth, don't get offended by what they say just because they tell you the truth. And this happens in relationships where Honey Bun will tell Bubba exactly how it was and he gets all upset at him. Why? Because she told him the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. <laughs> yeah, we hear the truth and we get mad, upset and angry. Well, that's going really well. Accountability is we open our heart and make ourselves vulnerable. The essence of isolation is actually escapism. The motivation to isolate is driven by escapism and just to get out and to get away. Escapism is choosing to remove yourself from pressure and just hoping that it goes away. It doesn't work like that. Uh, Hudson Taylor, another great man of God from years back, he says, it doesn't matter what the pressure is or where it comes from. What matters is where the pressure pushes you how you respond to the pressure. Will it push you away from your father, further into isolation, or will it push you closer into relationship with him? We decide which direction we go when we get under tension pressure. Do we just want to run away and escape? Well, unfortunately, our inclination as humans is not to run to the father, it's to run away from the father. Escapism 
is one of the most common pitfalls for believers. But don't fall in. Choose not to fall in. It's a bit like the example I've given before of the wolf and the flock of sheep. As long as the flock of sheep stay together, they have a better chance of survival. But after the yelling and the screaming of the wolves running by and unsettling the sheep, the one that bolts and runs for, to be on his own is the one that usually doesn't make it. And that's an analogy that can impact our lives as well. Don't be the one that runs off and think you can do it by yourself. The enemy has been doing this a long time. And he knows that if he can get us isolated, he is well on his way to wreaking havoc in our life. Am I isolated? The answer is, do you have accountability in your life? Do you have people who can speak into your life? How do you respond when someone talks honestly to you about your issues? Do you get offended? Do you immediately get into a defensive mode and try to justify yourself? Well, let me be practical before I finish today and give you seven characteristics of isolated people. This is all in the notes. This is going to go quickly. Number one, they tend to struggle with depression. Secondly, they tend to get a little weird in their theology. <laughs> Don't go bending God's word. <laughs> Don't bend the word into what you want it to say. Number three, they tend to be a, a, a little awkward socially. They even have, can have a hard time connecting with people. Number four, they tend to be ECR, extra care required people. They can tend to be a little needy. Number five, they tend to make poor decisions. Number six, they tend to be stuck de developmentally. And number seven, life tends to be all about them. Anne Ortland, in her book, Up With Worship, um, or the quote was the quote for Van Ortland in uh, the Swindoll book, uh, wrote, every congregation has a choice to be one of two things. You can choose to be a bag of marbles, single units that don't affect each other except in collision. On Sunday morning, you can choose to go to church or sleep in. Who, can, who really cares whether there is 92 or 93 marbles in the bag? Or you can choose to be a bag of grapes. The juice begins to mingle and there's no way to remove yourselves even if you tried. Each is part of all, part of the fragrance, part of the stuff. You see, there is something very poignant and powerful in these words of Jesus that he's wanting us to get in our spirit. And I realize by the Holy Spirit today that the Lord has already touched your heart and challenged you about how isolated you are. Maybe as a husband and wife, you're isolated. And you talk about it. Oh, we don't have any friends. We don't have this. We don't have that. Now anybody, well, why not? What's, what's the problem? Well, we need to talk about that. We need to come to an understanding that if you can identify the problem and there's a solution, then we start working towards the problem. Jesus, by the bending of his knee and washing the feet of the disciples, saying, I am willing to do whatever it takes to bring you into my circle of love. So here are some practical things. You need to be bathed. In other words, to establish your relationship with the Father. And that comes through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. That, uh, that relationship we have in blood. After you are bathed, you need others to help you maintain your fellowship with the Father. You are not designed to be alone. You are designed to be in covenant relationship and to join arms with one another and stand in faith together. There must be times when other people's needs will have to be met by God through you, through your service, through your humility. See, God is going to meet needs. And we sometimes just think he's going to do it supernaturally all by himself. You don't understand. There is a miracle in your hands. There's a miracles, all sorts of miracles in your heart. There's miracles in your words. We buried a sweet little premature baby the other day. And this family had gone through the, the, the loss of a son a few years before in a self-inflicted wound. And as I was hugging the mother of the family whose son it was, but whose daughter was, had this loss, most current loss, uh, she said, Pastor, I remember when you came into the house when my son was found dead and you whispered into my ear, 
and you said, don't allow the depression or the devastation of this drag you away. Something to that effect. And I said it just in greeting her and spontaneously by the Spirit. And she said, I held on to those words all the way through that. There is a miracle in your mouth. Open it. Say words to people. Say words to your spouse. Don't take it for granted that he or she, how they feel about each other. Say words to your children. Speak life over them. Don't pick out all their faults. They already know what they are because you've been talking about them for years. Speak to their future and to their ability and their capacity and to their potential. As you speak life, life will start to come forth. There will be times when you must take the initiative to invite others into the pain that you are experiencing. And what happens here, we think for the most part that other people just don't really care. And so we back away. Now don't back away. It's time to step forward and allow God to heal you. And it may be with the arm of a brother or a sister around you saying, we're going to make it through this together. You're going to come out of this okay. You're not designed to be alone. How many times have I said that this morning? You're not designed to be by yourself. James Dobson, who's a well-written uh, man of God in, in this great country, some years ago, he gave a series of lectures for a faculty and students at a seminary, and he talked about the subject of isolation. And during his talk, he talked about a boy named Danny. Then he was a young man whose isolation and insecurity became intolerable and eventually turned to anger. And after he had spoken that day, he received an anonymous, anonymous letter from one of the students. Dear Mr. Dobbs, Dr. Dobson, I am one of the Dannys that you spoke about in chapel today. Believe me, for I have experienced this for as long as I can remember. It's a miserable way to live. Yes, I'm a student at the seminary. But that doesn't make the problem any less acute. Through the years, particularly the last five, I have periodically gained a revived hope that somehow this problem will be overcome, go away or, or, or something. Then to my great disappointment, I find it is still very much part of me. That's when I lose hope all over again and of ever conquering it. I wanna be a minister of the gospel and feel that that is God's will. At the same time, I am aware of the paralyzing effect this deep problem has upon me. I want so badly to be adequate so that I can be, could better serve God and others. I wish I could talk with you even for a short time. However, I realize your schedule is busy. At any rate, thank you for coming to the seminary. Since this broken young man had not identified himself, Dr. James read it, the letter, the next day in the chapel service. After the lecture, that morning, uh, the young man came up and introduced himself. He stood with tears streaming down his cheeks as he spoke of isolation. He stood with tears streaming down his, down his face. And later, an administrator of the school said that he was the last young man he would have thought to have this kind of problem. His isolation was a secret to others and yet tormenting to himself. Sitting in the audience that same day was another student with the same kind of problem. He, however, never wrote a letter or identified himself. And three weeks after James's visit, he hung himself in the basement of his apartment. His roommates were so unaware of his problems, he hung there for five days before he was ever missed. Have you been bathed? Have you been cleaned? Are you saved? Don't leave this place today without knowing. It can happen this morning to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Ask him to come into your heart and you establish that blood-red relationship with him founded in the blood of Jesus. Are you isolated? Are your feet dirty this morning? Do you need someone to help you wash them? Don't leave without someone helping wash your feet today. Am I open to real relationships, real accountability? Do I have real friends that will speak into my life? Friends that will be honest with me? You need them. 
When people do extend accountability to you, when they do speak into your life, what is your reaction? Are you open and receptive? And then finally, are you willing to wash someone else's feet by speaking the truth in love? See, we have to be able to respond to this today in the way that you need to. If you have not accepted Christ as your savior, then in a moment when the prayer team comes, just say, I need to receive Jesus into my life. I need to be washed, I need to be cleaned. Not just baptized, you need to be baptized into Jesus, first of all, and receive him as Lord and savior. Maybe you need to join a C group. If you haven't, get in one. You need to develop an environment of real accountability. You need to stop complaining about what you don't have and start creating an environment for what you can have. When people expend, extend accountability to you and they speak into your life, are you willing to receive them? Are you willing, instead of rejecting them, to talk to you and impart to you? And as you put yourself into this position, God will begin to create an environment around you of healing and restoration. See, one of the things the enemy wants us to do is to keep things hidden in our life, thinking that as long as nobody knows, everything's gonna be okay. And some of you have already found out. Now, let me tell you this. Everybody doesn't need to know about your problem. We don't have to have a parade of people coming up and say, okay, this is what I'm dealing with, and this is what I'm dealing with. That's not gonna make you feel any better either. And that's not what he's talking about at all. But God's gonna put you into the counsel of trusted people who will love you through where you are. And there is victory on the other side of it for you as well. I've got to finish now, but go online, absorb these notes, read the rest of the challenges that are there and allow the Holy Spirit to minister life to you. Better than that, even before you do that, is respond this morning. Allow the Holy Spirit to minister to your heart and life. Accept Jesus as Savior. Get, ask someone to help wash your feet this morning. Allow someone to speak into your life and let God receive the glory. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for what you're doing by your spirit in this place right now. Lord, forgive us for putting ourselves in a place of isolation, thinking that this self-protection was actually gonna produce fruit in our life when it's actually brought frustration, it's brought depression. Some of us, Father, have struggled with deep issues and look, your last words to us was to wash each other's feet, was to bless one another to make ourselves vulnerable and to humble ourselves to wash someone else's feet and then let someone else wash our feet. We need you, Father. We need you in our lives. And I pray that salvation comes this morning. I pray healing comes today. I pray restoration comes by the power of your spirit and that you'll be glorified. We give you thanks and we give you praise for your faithfulness now. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap today. Give the Lord a hand clap today. God bless you. I'll see you next week. In your own way, just repeat these words. Say, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is my only hope. He is my only salvation. I believe that he truly indeed died, rose on the third day, and through his shed blood, he had procured my salvation. Come, Lord Jesus, forgive my sins. Come into my heart, fill me with your spirit, and enable me to live this new life and to walk in peace and relationship with you. Amen. If you have said that prayer here online, to you or to those online, let us know that you have 
and pray that prayer and accept Christ Jesus into your heart. And if you're here this morning, I want you to see Pastor Cherie or someone at the uh, kiosk in the back and let them know that today you have surrendered your life to Christ. Let us stand this morning. And as uh, I want to ask the prayer and altar team to come as the worship team plays softly. But when we depart, we have, we have received so much provision and food this past week. And we would like you to come by the gym after you re you're relieved from here and just pick up a bag of goodies because the Lord has truly indeed blessed this church. And so right now, come and the, uh, the worship team minister to us in song softly. Come and let one of our prayer leaders to minister to you this morning and let God be God in your heart and in your life to the glory of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 celebration you're dismissed you can go in the peace and the joy of Jesus gave me beauty for ashes turn my life around broke my chains and now I dance on side 